Joining us in studio today is Dr. Mireille Toyegira. She is a JRS refugee education advocate based in Malawi. Welcome to Jesuitical. Thank you very much for having me. We're super, super excited that you're joining us and in studio too. We always get excited when our guests are here. Um, So as I mentioned in the intro, you're an education ambassador for JRS based in Malawi. And you came to JRS as a refugee when you were a child. So going back to the beginning, could you tell us a bit about where you grew up and how you arrived at a refugee camp? Yeah. Well, I grew up for the most part uh, in Zaleka refugee camp. When we got there, I was about eight years old. But of course, I had left my home country, Rwanda, when I was about two and a half. So I had spent almost six years uh, on a very long journey in search of safety. Uh, so I grew up in that refugee camp. Uh, it's it's not as big as most refugee camps. It's just now it has about 30,000 people. But when I was growing up there, it was about maybe 10,000. 10,000? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how I got there now, and actually in Zaleka Refugee Camp, that was my first encounter with Jesu Refugee Service because they have a school there, primary school and secondary school and some post-secondary trainings. But at that time when I was growing up there, there was only that primary school. And for secondary school, we had to go outside the camp um, to pursue our secondary school education. So I left Rwanda to, to just summarize a little bit. I left Rwanda with my family uh, after the conflict, but of course I had lost my dad during the conflict. So we went to Congo, uh, but I lost my sister along the way as well. And then we in Congo, it, it was a refugee camp uh, called Shimanga, where we stayed for a while. Of, but of course I lost my mama, my mother there. She passed away due to illness. Uh, and then we, mm. so I was made an orphan at age, at age four. Was, but still, I was still young to understand what is death, what is conflict. I was still too yeah. young. And then from there, we moved because there was war now in 1996 in Congo. So I was. So who were you with? I was with my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after my mom died in the yeah. refugee camp, I was now with my grandparents. Okay. So when war started in Congo, we had to leave now, and we had to wander in the forest there in search of safety. So so through Congo in Angola. And then we reached a refugee camp in Angola with just my grandfather. My ma- grandmom had passed away a few days before uh, because she, she was tired, mm-hmm. the exhaustion of walking and sometimes walking without, you know, having eaten. So it was quite hard on her and she had passed away. From that camp in Angola, we went to Zambia and another refugee camp. And then uh, from that refugee camp, uh, I had this... She was a friend of my grandfather's in Rwanda, who she was in Lusaka, uh, that's Zambia's capital. And she found out that we were in, in the camp, and then she actually helped us to be able to move from the refugee camp to Lusaka so that I could go to a better school and also have a better life. So we went to Lusaka, and she found company sisters to be paying for my school fees, and then gave my grandfather a bit of money to start a small business. So in Lusaka, we stayed for a bit, and then that's when my grandfather heard about Zaleka refugee camp, that, you know, there was a good school, it was, a, you know, better conditions, because it was hard for him to maintain our life in the in the in the city Mm -hmm. so we went to Malawi in 2000 September I was about to turn nine Uh, that's when we reached Malawi Um, yeah I think that's the (laughs) bit of summary of how I got to Malawi and and were there schools in the other other camps or was this just like a better school yeah so in in Angola when Mm -hmm. the first refugee camp the school that was there was just um, not really just it was an informal school where you just all as kids you go and if somebody knows something (laughs) who just uh, come Mm -hmm. and teach you songs and stuff like that but it was under trees um and then in in the camp in meheba in zambia it was the same thing in the beginning there was it's some uh, not structured really just you go and just a bunch of kids you learn singing and some english words or french words Mm -hmm. and then but later they established a uh, formal school but still under trees but it was like structured like you know with grades and everything Mm -hmm. but and but my first really proper school which was like yeah really good foundational education was in zambia in in lusaka and then malawi as well when i got to the primary school there founded by Jesuit Refugee Service. Mary, hearing your story, it's hard for me to even imagine living through that that amount of tragedy. Um, 
and it's easy for me to imagine losing my faith in humanity and in God after losing so many people and seeing so much conflict. How how have you kept faith and kept your faith in God, kept your faith in humanity? Yeah. Well, when I was now going through all that, I didn't really think anything of it, you know, because you're living to see the next day. Yeah. You just, you know, oh, I'm alive today, I'm alive tomorrow. And yeah, but then as a teenager, that's when it just began to hit me. Like I would see other, you know, kids, for example, in, in boarding school, because we have visitors day where parents come and I would see, you know, other parents are coming, they're hugging their, their you know, their kids. And I felt sad many times. I would actually go and, and cry. Um, but, but still... Now, as I grew up older, um, there was still that bitterness, you know, like I would question my friends, like, do you really love me? Because I had lost so much and so many people. And to me, it's my little brain, it registered like they don't love me, you know. Mm. But that was not the case. They were dying. But in me, it was like, you know, nobody can love me unconditionally. You know, your parents are the ones who are supposed to love you no matter who you are. But now I don't have any parents like who can love me for who I am, you know. So I questioned my friends a lot, like, do you really care about me? But now my faith began to, like, I began to really see the how God was loving me through the people that were surrounding me, whether the lady who helped us or Jairus who built the school, the school in the, you know, there were, it was all the love of God through people, you know. And I began to see all that, especially in China. That's where my faith and really seeing that God loves me and God didn't stop being God, yeah. you know, because I, going th- I was going through that, but he was with me. But So when I saw that, it really helped me to continue to move on because I knew that, you know, no matter what, it's for a reason that I'm alive, and yeah. you know. Can we can we back up yeah. and how how did you get from Malawi to China? Yes. Okay. So in Malawi, I went through the primary school and then secondary school, and then um, at at the end of primary secondary school, we s- all sit for the same exam, and then you at the end of it. When the results came out, I was among the top six students in the whole country who got six points. Six points is like the highest grade you can get. So you get one point in each each subject, and they count six subjects. Wow. So I was among the top six. Mm. And then because of that, I got a scholarship to go study in China uh, through the Chinese ambassador who had been present during an award ceremony for the best girls with three of us, three girls and three boys. So... Now, when I got the scholarship, uh, but then I w- because I was a refugee, a Rwandese refugee, but there was really like a very, the, the, there were a group of people who really fought for me to be able to go as a Malawian because I wouldn't be able to go otherwise, you know. Why not? Um, I didn't have a passport. Mm-hmm. So they, in the end, they gave me Malawian citizenship, then a passport, and then I was able to go to China and pursue my studies there. Who were the people... Uh, advocating for you so that ceremony I'm, I was talking about the best girl award ceremony is organized by this radio station called Zodiac Broadcasting Station mm-hmm. and uh, they have this big thing you know that they they call out the three the best girls and then they have a big ceremony and um, so when I got the scholarship, they really saw it like we have to fight for this girl, you know, and it, the issue actually got to the parliament, you know, people discussing, should we not, should we give her? But in the end, there was a lot of public uh, people behind me who who said, you know, she's gotten this far, you know, why not give her the chance to continue? Yeah. So best, the radio station really played a very big part in that. So I imagine going to China for medical school meant you had to learn Chinese, yeah, which yeah. I've tried to do and failed. <laughs> uh, and I had a lot of good teachers. So how did, how did you learn Chinese? <laughs> so, um, excuse me, we left uh, Malawi and then we went to China to do language. But actually in the beginning, we didn't know that we were to do our studies in Chinese. We just thought we were going to learn just to get by. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that proved to not be the case. <laughs> so it was we were immersed in that in the language. You'd have classes from eight to five, just Chinese. Um, and of course, it was hard because that was the first time most of us began to fail subjects. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know, it was quite hard. But you know, you just find ways to make it work. You you help each other. You because in Chinese they have a saying that uh, they say do xie, do like everything, do more, like write more, speak more, like. 
that helps. So immersing in the the community, yourself in the community helped a lot to be able to to learn the language. And this at, at this point, this is you, your third language, your fourth language. Yeah, at this point, that was my huh, because now I could speak Kinyarwanda, which is my mother tongue from uh, Rwanda, and then Chichewa, which is from Malawi, and then I could speak Swahili as well, which I picked up in the refugee camp because people find a common language, uh, which is now in the in Zaleka refugee camp. That's Swahili. Yeah, so that was, and then I could speak English. So that was my fifth <laughs> language. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's impressive. Wow, yeah. and so I mean, medical school is hard enough. What, what so what were your impressions of China like, right? Mm. Um, so this is you're you're going away um, to a totally new place, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. What was your support system when you got there? Yeah, so when we got there uh, at the language school, um, we were lucky because there were other people actually, not just me and the other girl who we went together. We found people from all over the world, mm-hmm. especially Africa and Southern America. So that was that community because there were others who had been there uh, like before. So they're the ones who would help us, you know, get around because otherwise you wouldn't even know where to buy gloves. You know, yeah. how do you even say how much is that? Right. But we had people who were like helping us to navigate through the city. And then because you're learning Chinese so fast, you learn like within a month you can be able to get around. You know, even not just a month, like within a few weeks. Cause Maybe you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, like it's like from eight to five. And they make sure that in the beginning they teach you things that you can use, you know, like saying how much, good morning. And you're, yeah. And you're practicing it right You're practicing you right it, yeah. yeah, yeah. You've also mentioned that the people that you met in China really helped you to see your situation as not so much tragic, but more hopeful. How did yeah. they do that? Well, it was basically the church community, right? Because I began to join this church. It's a non-denominational church called Shenyang Christian International Fellowship where everybody just comes and support each other. So um, that's when I began to go to the church and they would I would people find people really being so nice to me and and you know uh, they would help me to understand the Bible and and what God says and all these things and and through their friendships really like people who didn't have a reason to love me who didn't have a reason to you know to help me and even though I was like a, sometimes harsh not not really harsh but I would question their intentions they were still there and mm-hmm. like, helping me understand like we st- we really love you you know and really helped me a lot yeah. Yeah. It sounds like education has been a very important part of your life. Very um, much. Yeah. How how has how has it shaped the course of your life and like where do you where do you think you would be if you hadn't had yeah. had those opportunities? Honestly, I I don't know where I would be right now. Like uh, looking back at the first time that I got that chance to go to a proper proper school that was in Lusaka. Like if that lady didn't do what she did, I don't know where I would be right now, really. I, I wouldn't. I, I, I what what know. lady and doing what? So the lady, I don't know, maybe I skipped that. So for us to move from um, from uh, Meheba, the mm-hmm. refugee camp, to Lusaka, there was this lady who was uh, a friend of my grandfather's. So when she came to the refugee camp, uh, she found out that we were there, and then she made plans for us to move to the capital so that I could get a better education. So she gave my grandfather like some money to start a small business. She went and found Komboni sisters to be paying for my school fees, right? And then uh, gave us money for transportation. So for uh, our move really meant that now I would go to a proper school, you know, and get a good foundational education. So that was the beginning of my transformation journey, I can say. So I don't know where I would be if she didn't do that. So what was, can you talk a little bit about what school was like? Mm-hmm. Um, in Lusaka, in Lusaka, I don't remember that much. But mm-hmm. in in I would I can uh, talk sure. a little about the school in um in the camp in Zaleka yeah. refugee camp. Yeah, that's the that's the JRS. Yeah, school. the JRS in Lusaka. I don't remember that much. Okay, yeah, sorry about. So that. I can re ask. Uh, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit what that school was like when you you got there and we're getting as you said like your first foundation and proper schooling? Yeah. So when we got to Zaleka. That was actually my, the first thing that my grandfather did was to enroll me in the Jesuit Refugee Service School there. That was the only school in the camp. And um, it was, it had, you know, great teachers, you know, the way we had great teachers. And at that time, we were very few. So each class would have maybe 50 students, which was good. And, um, well, it was close. 
it was very close so you just you know cross the street and you go to school um and we all loved really going to to the school because it felt like a safe place you'd go and learn and play and you know make friends and then go back and of course um even though now the conditions at school were good but now it didn't mean that conditions at home were that good you know <laughs> because mm. you know you are in a refugee camp where you're depending on monthly ration, rations where they give you maybe some corn some beans of which maybe it might not be enough for the whole month so maybe you go to school without eating you know and your tummy is just you know crying <laughs> for yeah. food mm. but later on they started giving porridge but during my time there we didn't have porridge at school and you know some of us had to go irrigate crops in the morning because later my grandfather had a garden and then uh, i would go early in the morning and irrigate crops and then go back home and maybe just wash my feet and then off to square go and we had really like we had the library that i loved so every time i would i would really rush that i have a little bit of time to go to the library and d- read some books and we had some volunteers who would come and and actually like read us stories mm-hmm. teach us some songs like like i don't remember there was there was this other volunteer who came and was really teaching us these great songs who would just be clapping and it was really fun mm-hmm. it was it was fun do you have fav- do you remember what your favorite books were then Mm, my favorite books I think when I was mostly in high in high school mm-hmm. were Nancy Drew the series yeah. the detective <laughs> Nancy Drew I actually yeah. remember reading all the books within a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> I would have a book and be cooking and reading <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing <laughs> So yeah. Mireille, what was it like to go back to Malawi after medical school mm. Well things had changed now the popular cuz now you can imagine after 6 years cuz i didn't go back for holidays mm-hmm. i just mm-hmm. stayed 6 years and went back so uh, things many things have ch- had changed the people had left you know most of my friends had actually like gone to to studies because now we in my class because yeah in my class we were very few people so some of them had gotten a chance to go to canada mm-hmm. right so most of my friends were gone now uh, people had grown um very you know bigger than myself and the camp had grown itself um the population has, has just grown and the camp was wider so I, w- I became i would be lost even in the camp myself even though i had grown up there but things have had changed tremendously yeah so your story is incredible um is it outside the norm what what is for most refugee children do they have the same kind of opportunities you have or um, are there less opportunities in different camps? Yeah. Talk about? Yeah. Well, so many refugee children have less opportunities because um, now the refugee reality is now more than we, how do I put this? Now we have more refugees especially like for example in my refugee camp where we were like less than 10,000 uh, maybe or maybe a little bit more but now we have like 40,000 people mm. and where are the most same of they c- where are they coming from now from Congo and uh Sudan. Burundi so the new refugees coming they're mostly from Congo okay. yeah so now you have the same amount of you know, you still have one primary school and one secondary school and now a huge population of refugees coming and everybody wants to be at the same primary school. So now you find that, you know, only a few percentage is able to enroll in the school, you know. And now for post-secondary school, it's it's very, like, we have very limited opportunities for post-secondary school for refugees, not just for Malawi, but everywhere, because I was, uh, I just visited Chad last October, and there, there's a very big challenge, like, um, you find that the only opportunities there for post-secondary, it's like learning English or computer, and some, a few people who get a chance to go through teacher training, but that's like only a few people. So, I would I would say that my case made was made different just because of the chances that I got, but not not that others lack the potential. They have mm-hmm. tremendous potential, but now because of the lack of opportunities, that I then the lack of opportunities make makes it makes our stories a bit different. Yeah. So what yeah. what would their story be like if without the opportunities? Well. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know. You know. Yeah. What do you think if somebody, you know, your 
maybe able to go through primary school and then secondary school of course even in the attending those primary school and secondary school you find that you have now in a class say 100 students in one class like for primary school so now you can imagine the quality that a kid is getting because yeah. the teacher is not able to track each one's performance so now going through primary school is is it becomes harder for students even to perform very well yeah mm -hmm. because the quality is now and then you finish and you don't have any anything to do afterwards and actually the lack of opportunities for university makes others th say okay now my family is very like we don't have much food like especially in chad right like my family is struggling and maybe you're the older one so you find that many just you know drop out because okay what's you know what's there for me even if i finish secondary school then there's nothing to look out up uh what's the word you know look for after yes yeah. look for after yeah there's nothing so why for, continue anyway for someone like that are they likely to live in a refugee camp their entire lives you say sorry for someone who who doesn't have an opportunity to go mm. to university are they mm. likely to live at the camp for their entire life or does does that happen yeah well like nowadays like the people are spending many like more years actually in displacement because the conflicts are becoming more you know Intense. Intense yeah. and not really ending anytime soon. So people actually just, you stay in a refugee setting for for more than 10 years, more than 20 years. People being born and raised in refugee camps and stuff like that. But also, like, there's more to that because um, for, for some countries, their policies still don't allow refugees to work outside the camp. So there's still, you know... Um, for most people, they just stay there and maybe mm -hmm. do a small business there. And there's really need for more like advocacy in that area for, mm -hmm. for people to see refugees as a resource that, you know, um, if you allow them to work, they can actually help, you know, the economy and stuff like that. Yeah. So you, you've been touring the United States and you've talked at the Vatican. What have you learned from sharing your story about how people around the world view refugees? Mm. Um from my tour, I don't, I don't know, I don't think of, because it's been me speaking mm -hmm. and uh, sharing my story and my experience. And people have been very receptive to mm -hmm. what I had to say and very, uh, I felt a very great response from the people, you know, seeing that, you know, there's something that each individual can do, you know, to make a difference. And, um, yeah. Do you ever, I, I imagine... You want to share your story to raise awareness and help other, um, other refugees. Um, right. But do you ever want to just like be? I guess you're never going to be a normal twenty year old, but you could go be a doctor somewhere. Um, mm. So what? What do you? What's challenging about kind of being held up as this beacon of hope for mm. refugees everywhere? Yeah. Well, it's not like I was held up. You know, it's 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 it was a decision of mine because after seeing how transformation it has been for me and really just my faith helping me to reflect more and and you know seeing okay what do I want to do you know what difference do I want to make what impact do I want to make it's not like I was forced into it it's something that I ha I decided to be able to use my story but at times it feels you know like um I feel the responsibility because there are many refugee stories, but not many have been put into in public like this. Not many stories have been put in public, and being able to to raise a voice for the many who haven't, who cannot be be heard. So I feel the responsibility to be able to use my story, but I I, I can only do so much. So <laughs> sometimes I just say, okay, you you don't have to do everything, you know. Just do whatever you can, and and hopefully, you know, you make a difference in other young refugees. But it's not really a burden. I wouldn't call it a burden. No. Is there another story that real that inspires you that you like to tell someone else's? Mm. Uh, yeah. Not in full because I don't really know much. But actually, when we were in um, <coughs> in the camp in Meheba in Zambia. Mm -hmm. W there was one of my classmates there under trees, of course, like <laughs> we used to compete. And actually her mom was our teacher. Uh, I just learned that like recently because 
I don't remember my teachers, but then yeah. she contacted me and she was she told me that we were classmates and her mom was my teacher, our teacher. And now she's she had has done most of her schooling under trees. Like she's she her story is more like mine. Now she's an investment banker somewhere in Europe. <laughs> which wow. is yeah. Very impressive and really it shows hope. Um that you know lives are being transformed and there is hope even though the what the numbers that we see can be overwhelming but mm-hmm. seeing that hope really can encourage people to do a little bit of something like a small step which changes somebody's life uh what could what can listeners who are listening to this podcast what what can they do to help maybe change lives mm-hmm. well there's a lot that can be done right there's yeah. a lot like one thing that they can do is maybe visit a website from Jesuit Refugee Service because they have a list of things that an individual, not not the government, an individual can do. Mm-hmm. Not just giving money, but you can fundraise, you know, uh, because Jesuit Refugee Service, among other organizations, they're doing a lot in the refugee settings, right? In terms of education, in terms of psychosocial support, in terms of livelihoods. So there's a whole list, like, fundraising there's advocacy like maybe writing a letter to your representative you know so that some policies can change and be able to help people you know refugees so if one can visit that website Jesu refugee service uh, usa website there's a list of things like you know that one can do uh, as an individual as a community as well yeah and folks who want to check out that website it's jrsusa.org and look for the section take action and Marie, just thank you again for joining us in studio and for sharing your wonderful story. We've Thanks. got one final question for you. If you could canonize anyone, living or dead, Catholic or not, who would it be and why? Mm. Well, it would have to be Severa. Okay, and who is yes. that? Yes. This is the lady that I keep mentioning who mm. has been very instrumental in my academic journey, not just academic, but my whole journey, um, who supported my grandfather and I to move from Meheba to Lusaka and then kept following my journey and helping me whenever I needed help, she was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think really if she hadn't done what she did, even though she didn't have much at that time, but her choice to help me and my grandfather, you know, change the course of my life forever. So I think that would, should, should be her. There are many people, <laughs> that would, but Severa, yeah. St. Severa. Severa. Yeah. Amen. All right, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so for much. having me, yeah. Thanks for watching our video. Please click on the subscribe button below for more insights into the world of faith, culture, and news from America Media.